the, the next segment that we have coming up is going to be 1099 gig worker tax talk updates. And I think this is going to be very informative. So let's go ahead and get started on that one next. All right. Next up on the gig virtual conference, we are pleased to put together this great workshop on dealing with important 1099 topics for independent contractors. All right. I know you guys may have forgotten I was still here, but my name is Hannibal. Uh, just going to be talking about a lot of the 1099 stuff. Uh, we're going to have our expert to come in and really break a lot of this down because right now, the, dealing with taxes is probably, I'm pretty sure, I'm sure you are aware of this, is one of the more uh, confusing, maybe frustrating aspects of gig work. I mean, I'll be completely honest here. Um, I. I had a lot of issues when I first started doing gig work. Um, just dealing with how much money should I put aside and all that thing, you know, like that. And we're going to have someone here. Uh, Marissa, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you today? I'm doing very, very well. I'm very <laughs> excited to talk to you because uh, the interesting thing about taxes, um, you know, I'm my father told me about this story of Al Capone. I'm sure you may are familiar as well. One of the most like notorious gangsters ever existed. And despite the fact that he did so many terrible things, actually he was born and raised in New York, um, moved to Chicago to do what he'd done. And the only way, the, I guess the government, were able to put this man away is the fact that he never filed any federal tax returns. And he went to jail for tax evasion. And the, despite the fact that all the other terrible things he has probably was accused of being of doing, he couldn't go down unless it was about the taxes. So IRS is very powerful. And Definitely. I think <laughs> if anything could be told, like if they could take down, you know, some mobsters, then, you know, we have to make sure that we're actually paying uh, our taxes and make sure that we're not getting in any type of trouble. And, you know, since a lot of people are just joining in the gig work uh, situation, it's a lot of confusion, especially if you're doing full time with your part time or, or being a full time gig worker. So we're excited to have you. Um, before we jump in, just tell us a little bit about your history of figuring out this whole situation with taxes and your experience working as an accountant and all that type of stuff. Okay. Um, while I have a bachelor's in business and I have been running my own business for many years, um, I started doing my taxes when I was doing a 1040 easy form. And as my taxes got more complicated, there was a big learning curve. And uh, so after years of doing my own, I started to do my family's and I've been working uh, for a company for about four years uh, doing it professionally. So um, I have some experience, you know, this is a field that changes every year. So, you know, experience is a learning, a learning continuing thing as we go forward. So, yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's, it's uh, very complicated. It seems like it's, it was designed that way. And then, you know, people like you have the superpowers that first way read all this dry text and all these can keep up with the updates while we just, you know, the regular, you know, me, just, you know, gig workers or even regular employees just trying to figure out, okay, what's the new rule? What's going on here? So let's just jump in real basic stuff in terms of, you know, gig work being taxable and some of the report reporting requirements that are changing for, you know, 2022. Um, like, you know, with the first thing, how much money you need to earn at any business before you have to tax or put on your taxes? Well, uh, these gig companies are going to start 1099ing people if you earn $600 or more uh, beginning this year with the 2022 taxes. So this is new uh, in the past. Um, I know some of the companies you've had to earn like 10 or 20,000 to get your 1099. Yeah. Um, what it means when you get a 1099 is, is that the company that paid you the money is reporting to the IRS that you earned the money. So if you get a 1099, the IRS knows you owe this money. So you can take it and file your taxes in the right way and get a write off your expenses, or they can take it as, oh, you earned $20,000, pay taxes on it. So when you get a 1099 now, you definitely know that you've got to move forward with this. Um, of course, like you say about the IRS coming after people, they are powerful. Uh, however, they're definitely in it for the money. Yeah. Um, you know, they're looking for the people who owe them the most. Um, but anytime you're putting yourself at risk for tax audit, um, you could be in danger 
if they feel like you've earned a lot of money that you haven't paid taxes on and they see it, then, you know, they might investigate. They're at least going to send you a letter, which will yeah. require you to go ahead and file. Yeah. Happened. Yeah. I mean, and, and it seems like a lot of, you know, celebrities, people who have earned a lot of money, a lot of their issues is about tax uh, issues. I, so it's like, you want to make sure you're doing it correctly. So you not really have to deal with a lot of this, the, 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 all the extra stuff that comes along with it. Right. Um, and people who are employees definitely have um, an advantage in that their taxes are being withdrawn for them. So they usually don't end up at the end of the year owing uh, tax dollars where people who are independent contractors can earn a lot of money and not have to pay any taxes on it until, you know, it comes time to file. And that chunk of change can be a, uh, painful if you're unprepared. So. Well, you know, I was unprepared. My first uh, year of actually doing a significant amount of gig work, because I had a W-2 at the time, and I doing the dog walking stuff, and I, I think I've earned an extra, I don't think it was 25 grand or something like that, and I was a dummy. I did not put anything to the side. I, I just thought, well, I had the W-2. Somehow I could try to figure this out in terms of um, oh, it won't be that big of a deal. And it, no, I, I wind up paying a lot more when I was not prepared for it. So mm -hmm. one of the most important things is keeping a record of your business expenses and taking that very seriously. And yes, it's boring and tedious, but it's extremely important to have those kind of records because you're just saving yourself a lot of headache at, you know, when you have to deal with the taxes and stuff like right. that. So we could go through, we have um, a little presentation here about managing taxes for good gig workers, um, starting from the beginning. Um, you know, whether you're part-time or full-time, it is something that you're going to need to consider, especially this year if you haven't had to worry about it in the past or felt like you needed to worry about it. Uh, definitely, if you're making more than $600, um, you need to look at it this year. So all of those earnings are taxable, aside from your expenses. Um and like we talked about before, in 2022, your uh, the 1099 requirement is changing, which is going to uh, mean that a lot of people are getting them that didn't get them in the past. Um, if you fail to file, you will get a letter if you received a 1099. So you need to take it seriously when you get those. Those will be coming out um, usually the end of January. You should have them by mid-February. So if you feel like you earned income that you haven't seen that by then, you know, you, if it's more than 600, you might want to investigate. Um, so as an independent contractor, when you get these uh, earnings on your 1099, you're allowed to deduct expenses, which we all know, um, and helps us to alleviate some of the tax burden that we have to pay on the, um, on the earnings, which is one thing that employees are unable to do to write off their gas and some other expenses. Right. So, um, you know, one thing, if you yeah. oh, go ahead, like, uh, go ahead. Cause I, I just saw a question about, um, the quarterly estimated tax payments. Um, but I'm sure, I think you're probably going to get into that as well. Um, that's something that I've seen the many questions about that. I've been honest, I have not jumped in to even do that myself in terms of, uh, but I think that's probably the, is, will you consider that the, the smartest way to handle your taxes by making those quarterly uh, payments? So if you earn more than $1,000, um, if you owe, sorry, if you owe more than $1,000 yeah. in taxes on your 2022 taxes, um, then you will be required to pay um, quarterly payments or they will expect you to. And if you don't, then they will charge you a penalty. Mm. Now, it's fairly minimal, that penalty, uh, which is why a lot of people sometimes don't notice it. It's like 0.5%. And then it maxes out at 25%. So we're talking mm. about, say you owe $1,000 that first quarter when you didn't pay your taxes, you're only going to owe 25% of that. So if it's 250, um, what is that? Like less than $12. It's a small, I'm not, I don't have my calculator in front it's of okay. me. Yeah, I'm terrible with math too. So, so it's I'll, not I'll a, a huge amount if you're only owing $1,000 in taxes, but as that goes up, it can really become significant. Yeah, so, so it's a snowball effect. <laughs> one thing that people always question is, well, how do I know if I owe a thousand dollars in taxes before I filed my taxes? So, like the first quarter comes, how am I going to know that I'm going to owe a thousand dollars? So, um, there is a law called the safe harbor law. I'm kind of scrolling down, okay. but basically, if you pay, 
I want to say it exactly right. Um, you won't have to pay an underpayment penalty if you pay at least 90% of the tax you owe for the current year, mm -hmm. or if you take what you owed last year and you pay 100%. So say last year you owed $1,100 in taxes. You feel like you're going to be earning at least the same amount this year, then right. I would say you go ahead and make quarterly payments on that $1,100. And if you pay that full $1,100 in your four quarterly payments, if you owe $5,000 in taxes, you're not going to be penalized. Right. Because you paid that 100% of what you owed last year, that's kind of the best estimate you can do. So you can also talk to um, a tax preparer and do some estimates, you know, go in and... And the IRS has some links. I put some links in here where you can go and estimate, like put in your quarterly earnings at the end of the quarter and they okay. can give you a form and kind of tell you what you need to be paying. So. That's awesome. Yeah, we're going to try to put a lot of those um, those links and all that information either in the description below or we'll put it somewhere so you guys can check it out. Because, uh, you know, it's just as we are you know, independent contractors, we are running a business, self-employed. This is the stuff that you're going to have to really pay attention to, especially if you want to do this full time. And of course, I think many of us that's probably in the chat right now are earning more than six hundred dollars. Uh, a lot of us are making. I mean, you see some of the videos, thousand dollars, you know, right. fifteen hundred. So it's definitely happening and you don't want to get caught, you know, you know, within a bad spot. So, yeah, keeping right. track of your records seems to be very, very important. I um, saw that message. Yeah. The. Um message from Lisa, the yeah. driven mom about that. They know how much we owe, but we don't, but the truth is they don't know. They're also mm -hmm. estimating and they're going to, they're going to estimate you owe on your full earnings before your um, expenses that you get a write off. So they're making a guess and they're going to tell you oftentimes that you owe a lot more <laughs> than what you do owe. So when you get those letters that say you owe, you know, how much money in taxes, you actually need to sit down and create your tax document and um, you probably can do better than what they're going to tell you because they're going to look for the most. Um, yeah. So yeah, um, aside from the quarter, the estimated payments that you might consider making, I think a lot of gig workers aren't having to pay a thousand dollars of taxes a year, depending on how much they're working. Right. Um, but definitely many people are in that category and need to consider. I am. So I got to figure that out. <laughs> yeah. um, but really, um, and there's going to be a lot of questions and we're going to try to answer as much as possible. But let's just be honest. OK, should we really invest in getting someone else who knows what they're doing to work on our taxes? I know a lot of people do it themselves. But if you had, you know, a, a magical wand to kind of like if, if you're able to just get, you know, all of us to figure out one a really good way, a fishing way. Should we just get someone else to do this for us, or should we actually try to learn mm -hmm. a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff ourselves? In terms of uh, you know, keep, like I said, keeping track of our records is something I think we should all do. But in terms of really like, you know, doing our payments and, and calculating all this ourselves. Right. I think that if you know what you're tracking and what you're doing, like say you've been doing gig work for a lot of years, um, I think it's. Very, it's very possible for people to be able to do their own taxes. But like you were saying, you've got to be prepared. You've got to be tracking your mileage. Um, one thing that I think makes it easier is to have a separate bank account where mm -hmm. your earnings go and all your expenses go for that, uh, the whatever gig work business you do. And maybe you do a lot of different gig apps. Yeah. As long as you have one bank account that manages those and kind of keeps it separate from your personal account, it really will simplify at the end of the year, um, you figuring out what your expenses were and and also kind of verifying what you owed because it's possible you could, or what you earned, it's possible you could get a 1099 NEC and a 1099K for the same income. So, yeah. you know, especially if you're getting Venmo and PayPal payments, you need to be aware of that and yes, be able to exactly. actually see. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and that's why I, I was really excited to talk to you because I know now uh, many gig workers, um, freelancers, all, you know, a lot of people are, are paid through uh, Venmo, Cash App, Zelle. I mean, so many of these uh, apps now that, you know, at one point you, you know, many of us thought like, hey, if I get like a private client or I'm doing something, I'll get, you know, Venmo and 
or, or PayPal, and I have to worry about I don't have to worry about claiming that on my taxes. But now that has changed, and there's many questions of saying of, of people saying, well, if I send um, a PayPal payment and I put in the notes or put it in the category friends and family, will that would I be able to get you know, away with claiming it on our taxes um, compared to like this is my friend compared to you know, you're actually running a business in here. Um, do you think that you're playing with fire to even try to, I guess, you know, navigate through that without just being honest and say, hey, listen, I'm getting paid through Venmo. Let me claim that. Hmm. You know, when we get someone like that who has a Venmo with personal and business transactions, and maybe they're going to get one annual statement at the end of the year, or they're going to give us their statements that we have to go through. They're not going to have to pay taxes on what was personal, right. but they do need to keep records of that. I mean, you can't just say, well, this amount was personal and this wasn't. I mean, you kind of need to have some form of documentation of that, um, whether it's a spreadsheet, whether you write it down on a piece of paper. Um, maybe even you write out a list of different places that make the transactions. This person is personal, you know, whatever. But I would say that if you're getting that 1099 and it's being reported to the IRS, that you're going to need to account for it in some way. And maybe that's putting in the income as earned and writing off, you know, 10,000 personal family transactions and just documenting it on your tax return. Gotcha. Um, but because these things are all so new, you know, I think gig works kind of thrown the IRS for a loop. It's not like there's a law or a rule to address every situation. Right. And in fact, the more they try to do that, the more they complicate it. So it's more like, figuring out what they say about certain situations and trying to effectively apply it to yours and then documenting how you felt like that was the right thing to do. So that if you do get audited, you can be like, well, I mean, these were personal expenses I can show you. And they'll, you know, I yeah. think that has a lot of clout versus, well, I don't know. I just estimated. <laughs> yeah. That's kind of guess, right? <laughs> yeah, so it's like you know, and we, I think that's really the most important part. I think in terms of the, there's apps now that make things much easier than before. I don't even know what was. Right. I mean, it was happening, but you know, maybe a two a decade or two ago, how um, this was very complicated. You had to, you know, probably have a pile of papers, a pile mm -hmm. of receipts in the shoebox. You had to kind of go through it. That preparation was probably extremely exhausting. Now people have, still do that. Still <laughs> Believe me, people still bring in a box people of like receipts. Stay, like, yeah, they oh stay in their, their ways. But mm -hmm. these apps, are, like Stride was uh, one that mm -hmm. you suggested, you know, the mild, the expensive uh, expense uh, trapping apps. I think a lot of the apps that the gig, uh, the gig workers are able to have access to gig-wise, a lot of them have the mild trackers. Um, now the expense trackers are coming in. So there isn't much of an excuse not to know, at least your mm -hmm. expenses, because you're able to connect your your you know a business account right your account that you're that you're spending to pay for your gas or your yeah. your all those expenses for your business and the app is collecting everything and you're able to you can even um i think one app i think it's quickbooks self-employed you're able to swipe left and right left i think is like a personal and right is business so you'll be able to see all your transactions so it's very useful yeah. nowadays i saw the message from dub I can't remember who the name was WG. about that. He's, he's estimated 75% of his earnings as mileage. Mm. Um, and he hasn't been audited. Yeah. I don't think that will trigger an audit okay. unless somebody is personally, the thing is, if you were to get audited in the future, for some reason, if something did trigger an audit, they might question that and say, well, what kind of proof do you have? And, you know, you might have to defend that at that point, but I don't, I don't, Honestly, there's lots of people claiming all kinds of bogus nonsense on their taxes for years on end. Yeah. And it's it's getting passed through, but it's the few that have something that for some reason, either a random pick or, you know, maybe um, they've done something. You know, I would say that if your business loses money year over year over year, you could be setting yourself up for an audit. You know, yeah. as a business, they intend that after five years, especially, you're going to start seeing a profit. And that um, that is something that can trigger an audit. I don't know how much they're paying attention to people who are making smaller amounts of money with that. Do you think but do you think that could always change? Yeah. Do you think that the, the trigger, like I said, the trigger an audit, is it algorithm based? Is it prediction based? Like, OK, 
especially if you if, if someone is claiming something, I guess, um, out, outrageous. Again, again, that's subjective. But in terms of how it would trigger, would it be someone just being very, very aggressive, if that's the lack of a better term, on what they're claiming, or right. is it random? I mean, I think there is some randomness to it, but I definitely think that, you know, if you earn $75,000 of income a year and you take a loss on that income every year, that you definitely are putting yourself in a position that you could trigger an audit. Any business that continues to take a loss is in the danger zone of um, being audited. You know, I have a client that runs a a business doing like land mitigation. They have a, a lot of big equipment and they cut trees down and uh, make a lot of money every year, bring in a lot of money and they lose a lot of money every year. And, you know, for years we file their taxes as a loss and it goes through, but we always have to warn them that at some point the IRS could say, this is a hobby. It doesn't look like you have any intention to earn money, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And, and you could be audited, but yeah, there is no magic key. And I think that for years they haven't been auditing a lot. They're right. understaffed. Um, as we all know, they are increasing their staff in great numbers. Yeah. Um, the claim like is that these something. are, yeah, the claim is they're going to be um, auditing the upper middle class and higher incomes. However, I would think that, you know, we should all as business owners be aware of the things that trigger and just do our best to be filing properly in case, or at least be able to defend what we think is proper. I like that <laughs> no one. <on> our filing. <laughs> hey, listen, if you're going to do this, you better have a backup plan. Or at least like I said, uh, right. I don't know. If, again, alibi. I don't know if that's a lack of a better term. I mean, kind um, of. You kind of got to <laughs> say why you did it the way you did it, right. and have it make sense. Um, it's still no guarantee. They still might be like, "Well, that doesn't work," but it's better for them to say that doesn't work. You know, we have to do it this way, and you owe rather for them than for them to say it was some kind of fraud that you committed. Gotcha. I mean, that's the biggest thing. If if it appears as though you've been committing tax fraud, that's when. It's not Troubles just penalties. Happen. Yeah. 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 Um, do you ever mind? I have a question posted. Uh, doesn't, doesn't it? Well, just because someone got away with years doesn't mean they can't still get audited. Uh, right. Right. The IRS still has like, seven years to audit uh, you. Mm -hmm. And this okay. is true. You could be doing something incorrectly for years and get away with it your whole life. And they never, nobody ever triggers into it, finds it, says this is wrong. You have to do it differently. Or if something triggers an audit, they could go back to things that everybody does. Okay. And um, they say, no, that's not right. You can't do it that way. Well, <laughs> yeah, go back and get you for it. So yeah, Be a lot careful. of people, when they realize they've made a mistake, they're going to go back and amend as many as they can to try to correct it. Um, gotcha. Gotcha. But, um, so before we continue, I want to jump in with, um, with Moves Financial, a special video from Moves Financial. Um, a really great, um, basically a gig. It's banking exclusively for gig uh, workers. Um, they were able to put together this uh, video in really short time, so props to them. And then after that, we're going to come right back. Uh, we still have to talk about the mileage rates, expenses, and I'm sure there's tons of uh, questions asking about everything that we're talking about now. So we're just going to take a little, little few-minute break and uh, get right back into it. Hey everyone, thanks for joining us in Virtual GigCon 2022. We're incredibly excited to team up with Pedro, Rideshare Rodeo, and Hannibal to help address some of the financial challenges that gig workers face. Moose started with a mission, to create a gig economy that works for its workers. For the past decade, we've seen an incredible amount of innovation lead to today's gig economy. The companies leading this industry have promised and delivered easy, fast, and affordable services to everyday people. It's clear that consumer behaviors have changed and new value has been created. However, much of this value has come from the dedicated hard work of an often overlooked and growing group. You, the drivers, couriers, shoppers, walkers, and workers of the gig economy. We've heard from thousands of gig workers describe their experiences from the highest of highs to the lowest of lows, both the unpredictability of their work and the flexibility that it gives them. Through speaking directly with gig workers, we know one thing is clear. We share the same vision. A vision where gig work gives people the opportunity to take back control of their lives, gain the flexibility to manage their own schedules, and find greater purpose in their careers. 
So regardless if you're a multi-apper, early bird career, late night driver, ambitious entrepreneur, part-time student, or a full-time parent, not everybody has to fit the mold of a nine to five Monday to Friday job, and that's okay. But with this, we also understand the challenges that come with being a gig worker. The way gig workers access and manage their finances hasn't kept up with the way that they work. The gig economy just hasn't been working for its workers. We at Moves aim to change that. It's about time your work gets recognized as valuable and that you have access to better banking designed with you in mind. Moves gives you the tools to bridge the gap between your finances and the vision we all aspire for. Gone are the days of bi-weekly paychecks, constant credit checks, and rejected loan applications. Now more than ever, modern day workers need modern day solutions. Moves started in 2020 in the midst of the pandemic as we saw the world propped up by gig workers. During this time, the way people thought about work permanently shifted. Fast forward to today, Moves has tens of thousands of members across the United States working on over 20 supported gig platforms. Throughout this showcase, we'll walk through exactly how Moves works, how better banking can help manage your everyday finances, why we're giving you free stock just for being a gig worker, and highlight exciting product features that are on our roadmap. Last but not least, if you're new to Moves, you'll receive a $10 sign-up bonus if you open your Moves spending account today. Learn how you can get more out of gig work when you bank with Moves. Let's get into it. Hey, Virtual GigCon. My name is Alwyn and I'm the growth manager here at Moves. Our team has spent the last few years designing Moves to be the home for your gig business. But what does that mean? It means accessing cash advances to cover unexpected expenses. It means earning stock rewards in the gig apps you power. And it means banking features designed exclusively for gig workers, rather than having them fit the mold upheld at traditional banks. As a gig worker on the go, we connect with all the major gig platforms and many more to help you get a clear picture of how you work, providing you in-app tools to track towards your weekly earning goals and upcoming deposits. Our spending account carries no monthly maintenance, overdraft, or account fees, gives you free use of ATMs in over 55,000 locations, and access to weekly gig payouts up to two days early. Once approved for your Moves spending account, you can begin using your Moves virtual card immediately by adding it to your mobile wallet. Say a rock cracked your windshield last night, or perhaps you need an oil change, or you're just in a pinch for a tank of gas. As you begin to deposit your gig earnings into your Moves spending account, you'll be able to unlock cash advances of up to $1,000 to help you cover unexpected expenses when you need it. Moves cash advances will help you get back on the road and earning in no time. And with our built for gig worker repayment structure, we're committed to meeting our members where they are, which means repayments only happen as you earn. Again, we know gig work is unpredictable, but you're managing your money doesn't have to be. Like we mentioned at the very beginning, Move's mission is to make the gig economy work for its gig workers. We see an important vacuum that needs to be filled to provide a genuine and legitimate voice to demand change for everyone here. To do so, we want to make every gig worker an owner, an owner in the gig companies you help power. By joining Move's, you're building a voice. And better still, it will cost you absolutely nothing. Moves members are able to earn stock rewards with every qualified purchase that they make on their Moves card. From the driver's seat to the seat at the table, you can earn your share and join thousands of other gig workers who own the future of the gig economy in the United States. Instead of waiting for change, let's work together to make sure that the change happens. So come join the movement. Sign up before October 31st using this link and you'll receive a sign up gift of $10 deposited directly into your Move spending account. We can't wait for you to join the movement. Now back to Matt. What's been most exciting to me about this process is how much clarity we have in our vision, but also how much we learn every day when we talk to gig workers like you. We spent countless hours talking to hundreds if not thousands of gig workers to better understand the problems they face, the features they need, the things they'd like us to prioritize. Nothing we do is possible without hearing from you, having your involvement, getting you involved in our movement. So I'm excited to have you join us and help make moves better for the rest of the gig economy.
shout out to movesfinancial.com. Check out the website. It's banking exclusively for gig workers. Um, and shout out to all the other uh, sponsors and people who are, who are creating products for gig workers. I think that's extremely important because they have your, um, I, you know, they, they understand your story. Many of them have done gig work. They understand that the current crop of things that either help with your banking or taxes and stuff like that. They, they're from an old model, which is the W-2 work. Well, this is, you know, featured for gig workers. So check out food, uh, foods, movesfinancial.com and check them out. So we have about, you know, 10 to 15 more minutes with Marissa. Um, and I guess we'll just get into exactly, you know, what the expenses that we have to track in terms of um, all the things. Again, we got a lot of expenses we have to deal with. Um, also, the mileage rate. So we can get get some of all that all that stuff uh, out of the way. Okay. Well, yeah, a big question for people is, um, are you going to take the standard mileage rate or are you going to claim your actual expenses? Um, for most gig work gig workers, it makes sense to do the standard mileage rate. What this means is you're going to track all your business miles. I know that Uber and some of the apps are going to give you a number of miles that you drove for them, but it's Better if you track it yourself, you know, right. keep that on your own. Um, and this year is a little different than every other year. We're getting between the months, uh, between January 1st to uh, the last day of June, it's 58.5 cents per mile. And from July 1st to December 31st, you get 62.5 cents per mile. Mm -hmm. And I think that they, I mean, I, I know they've done that because of the increase in gas. So that does complicate things a little more this year that you need to be tracking your mileage uh, the first half of the year and the second half. Um, I would say you also want to check how many miles goes on your car if you're using it for personal use for the year. So January 1, write down your mileage, write it again at the end of the year, um, because it's good to know how many personal miles versus business were put on your car. Um, they actually do like to see that in the calculation. I know not a, a lot of people don't put it in, but it is, uh, you know, one more um, bit of information that can help you. Right. So when you claim that standard mileage rate, I saw some questions about gas and other expenses. You don't right. get to claim any other car expenses. Um, for example, uh, like the interest you might be paying on a car loan, lease payments, uh, you can't depreciate a car, you don't get to um, expense your gas, any repairs or maintenance, um, your insurance, um, and car washes is a hot topic. A lot of people say that car washes is only when you're doing actual expenses. Um, however, there are some very good arguments that especially when you're doing ride share and having passengers in your car, right. um, that that that's a, a separate expense um, of you uh, keeping your car up at, up to standard for driving. So with car washes, you know, some people write them off with standard uh, with the standard mileage rate. Um, traditionally, it is only supposed to be with actual expenses. Right. So the standard mileage rate is easier it's oftentimes go going to give you a better deduction. However, um, you know, maybe it's a good idea to track it both ways during the year. Track your actual expenses and track your standard and then see at the end of the year if um, it's better one way. But one thing to keep in mind is that if you're driving a car and you start claiming actual expenses, if you claim it this year, you have to continue to claim actual expenses for the remainder of the time you're using that car. Oh, okay. So That's a lot of people point might point. have, you know, they buy the car, they have really high interest payments on it. It's a good idea to do the actual expenses. However, when the car is paid off, they maybe don't have as much expenses and they could be doing better with the mileage. So, okay. yeah. I'm wondering if it's different. I mean, if you're just driving, if you're doing a ride share where it's exclusively driving in terms of longer distances, I'm wondering if that's probably going to be a better idea. But also, if you're driving long distances, you probably are using a lot of the other expenses. So I guess it depends on the person and what they're, you know, how they're conducting their business. Right. 
Right. I know that some people who have a really old vehicle that requires a lot of repairs every year, like maybe they have an old work truck and they spend a couple thousand in repairs a year, they might choose actual expenses because of that. But yeah, interesting. Yeah. I would say most people, the standard rate is better. However, if you question, track them both. Yeah. yeah I think that's probably a better, just, mm -hmm. you know, you, you never know. You want to make sure you have it. Like personally, I think for me, I think I'm probably gonna go with the actual expenses um, because of, I don't drive as much compared to maybe a year ago or two years ago when I did exclusive, you know, food delivery. So again, you want to make sure you track both because you never know which one will benefit you the most. So um, the other thing with the actual expenses that you should keep in mind is if you use your car for personal use, um, that's another reason why you have to track your mileage even so, because you're going to need to divide it by a percentage. Say you, you drove 10,000 miles last year, 5,000 was personal, 5,000 was business your actual expenses are going to be 50% of what your car expenses are at that point. Right. So you have to divide it by what is business use versus personal. So that's another thing to keep in mind where you got to track your miles either way. Gotcha. If that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, and again, we appreciate you even coming, uh, coming by to talk about, because this can be a, a own con of taxes and all the questions in terms of all the stuff that people are breaking down. But I think you're providing a lot of, of value in the in limited time we have left. So in terms of, um, I think we had, a, I saw a question uh, earlier on about um, what you can write off in terms of office, like, you know, office supplies or tolls, parking, um, those things that I guess, again, dealing with the gig apps, uh, what, what is your suggestions in terms of what you can deduct in those situations, meals, I think someone was talking about, you know, lunches, you know, how, what, what's, what's your advice on those kinds of expenses? So with meals, um, you can, you can only deduct meals when you are either meeting with clients, mm -hmm. uh, traveling for work, which doesn't mean, you know, you're, not home when lunch comes and you buy lunch, <laughs> you know, it means like you're actually leaving town, going to another location. Um, yeah. Um, or like a business conference. Um, yeah. you would need to keep records of those. Like if you have the receipt right on that receipt, what you did. So, you know, one thing that maybe rideshare drivers or, somebody in that sort could do for meals is if you get together with a group of drivers and you sit down at a certain time of the week and kind of analyze how things are going and build strategies and talk like that, you know, maybe you could write that off or as a business meeting. Right. If you are talking right. about, yeah, but you got to legit have something. It can't just be like you were hungry <laughs> and you bought food. You know, that's not, doesn't quite qualify because everybody has to eat. You know, you're going to have to eat no matter what. So it has to be sense. business related for it to be a write off. You know, actually, they are 100% deductible, those business qualifying meals um, oh. as of the last few years, which is, you know, different. It's been 50% um, for the majority of those meals in the past. So uh, we'll see if that continues beyond the 2022 tax season. Gotcha. Gotcha. So other things, you know, if you maybe you do a dumpling and you advertise you have some kind of listing you put up uh any kind of advertising that you do for your business is deductible um if you you know the office space you can deduct an office it's a little tricky with something depending like if you just drive uber and you want to deduct space for an office you might have trouble defending that Right. depending on how much time, you know, that space has to be dedicated as office for your business. So, I mean, you got to think how much time am I really spending doing office work for my business? If you run a lot of apps and you do a lot of sitting and trying to track your expenses and your, you know, what you're going to do, and you may genuinely have office space that you use specifically right. for the business. And in that case, you can write off your space. You can write off a percentage of the rent you pay if you rent a, um, your home or if you pay a mortgage and insurance. All those things can be partially deducted on your office. Um, there is a, a formula. You're going to be dividing it the space by the whole house. So you're going to use a percentage. Um, Lovely math. Yes. <laughs> 
Um, I think I saw a question earlier about um, cell phone use. So that's a really tricky one, at least mm -hmm. in my mind, is the fact that you do use your cell phone for the apps, but also it's personal. Right. Um, is there a hard and fast like deduction percentage or like how, how would that, what we suggest for the cell phone use? Yeah, I would say a, a lot of people in business, not just the gig apps, apps face this, that they right. use their phone for business, they use it for personal. If you have a landline that's personal, you are not supposed to be able to write that off for mm. business. However, if you have a cell phone, if you have a cell phone strictly dedicated for gig apps and that's all you use it for, it's 100% deductible. Okay. Otherwise, you're going to need to kind of figure out how much do I use it personal? How much do I use it for business? Yeah. You know, maybe, maybe you don't talk on the phone much and you don't text. You just have it for emergencies and you use it for your work. You might use it 75%. I would say generally people who are questioning, they're going to divide it 50, 50. Yeah. I think but I would think good. it through before you make it a random estimate, you know? Yeah. If it applies. Yeah. It, it, again, it, it, a lot of it, like I said, is based on how you conduct your business and mm -hmm. how much you're putting in the effort and stuff like that. So that's, that's pretty awesome. Um, as we kind of, uh, kind of end, you know, are we going towards the ending here? Um, like, I guess, if we can go figure out like the biggest mistakes or the biggest um, missteps that a lot of us um, have, if you could you could put it to general um, people who are you know like everybody or gig workers in terms of their taxes. If you had a, if you were able to talk to all of them, like what should they be doing to avoid some of the common mistakes that a lot of them are doing? Like in terms of you know, like not not keeping track of their finances, but if you were able to give them some um, words of advice on how to handle the taxes the next uh, year and uh, probably forever. But what, what do you think? Right. I would say um, tracking, like we've talked about before, tracking your expenses so that at the end of the year, when it does come tax season, there isn't this huge mountain of what did I spend money on? And, you know, mm -hmm. honestly, I hardly remember what I spent money on last month, let alone a year ago. So when we're talking about doing taxes for January of the year before, you know, who yeah. remembers if you didn't, if you didn't track it, you could really genuinely be losing some expenses that are deductible um, or some mileage or whatever it is that you didn't track. And, and that hurts people. I would say the other thing is that, you know, having the goal to write off every bit of income that you earned as expenses year after year so that you avoid taxes could be a mistake, especially going forward you know, when they're paying more attention to this kind of thing. And there's so many gig workers. I mean, it's such a huge population in the U S that I really feel like they are going to start targeting people who make a significant amount of money every year and write off, you know, most of it. I mean, show a profit, not just for to avoid an audit, but really because generally you are making a profit. You're using some of that money you get to live on. Um, and when it comes time to buying a car or buying a house, you know, it's really good to rep to, to be able to show that I do, I make money. <laughs> I don't just lose money every year. I actually, uh... <laughs> that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, Marissa, thank you very much. Um, there's a lot of really great information. Um, I learned a lot actually. Like I, I know that there's certain things I probably should spend a little bit more time preparing and understanding what's going on. So thank you for taking time to uh, talk to us and answer some of our questions. I know a lot, there's probably more questions they could probably answer within just an hour. But again, thank you very much. And, uh, you know, Steve is very lucky. I'm sure he, well, you know, he needs you. to know that. And He's very lucky uh, to have <laughs> thank you. Thank you for having me on. And I did want to say that um, yeah. uh, maybe at the beginning of the year, um, on the rodeo channel, we might do a few more uh, tax information. That'd be fantastic. Presentations. So, if you had, do have things in particular you'd like to hear about or dive into, you know, get that information to Steve. Awesome, awesome. I will look forward to that. So I, I don't want to get, I don't want to get visited by the tax man uh, <laughs> either. So, <laughs> really appreciate you uh, coming through. So, um, right now, after this, we're going to draw another. Uh, actually. A, I'm sure you guys, not everyone was here maybe in the beginning and haven't seen uh, Let's Play DoorDash's video. Uh, we're going to play that real quick. And then we're going to go right into talking to Bryce from Solo. Pedro and Solo are going to be talking about 
the solo app, which I think is amazing. Um, it's 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 well, you know what? Just stick around. They're going to break all that down. You're gonna not want to miss any of this. So, again, thank you, Marissa, and let's uh, let's let's go on to the next section. Thank you. No problem. <laughs> Have a great day. You too. Next up.